Hello everyone, Grandpa Ron here again. Hope you're all well and happy. We have a beautiful day here in Montana. A good day to get into God's Word, see what His truth has to tell us. Today we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 17 in our basic Bible study, A Slice of Truth series. Remember last time we read about how God miraculously provided the manna, bread-like, wafer-like substance uh, for them to survive on. We alluded to the fact that uh, Christ compared himself to the manna, that he was the, the bread of life. And now we're going to move into another area in the chapter 17 where the people are thirsty again and they're complaining and we're going to see some interesting parallels between this water and some of the claims of Christ and um, there's just so much uh, in this chapter even though it's fairly short that there's no way we can cover all of the things that it touches on but we'll go through and briefly discuss a few of the items and uh, I hope you'll find it interesting so let's look at chapter 17 of the book of Exodus. Verse 1, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Now this area, uh, we're not sure exactly where some of these areas are, but some of them historians get pretty close a very, very dry region. And uh, thirst can be a very compelling need. You can't live without the water. And uh, the people were getting frustrated. Now, they had seen God's provision in the manna. They had seen provision uh, in other things uh, in the last uh, chapters. and But they keep falling back into the complain mode. Uh, they don't remember God took care of us uh, in this crisis, and He took care of us in this crisis. It seems like every time a new, a new crisis comes up, they forget what God has done in the past and uh, start to wring their hands and don't know what we're going to do. And that's what they do here. Verse 2, Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that may, may, we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Saying, you're not really complaining to me. You're complaining to God. I'm just a, a mere man, a representative here. And your complaint is with God himself. Verse 3, But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? They're actually heaping this blame on Moses to the point of uh, being very angry. Verse 4, So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to these people? A little more, and they will stone me. They're so upset uh, and angry, they're ready to, to rebel and kill me. Verse 5, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. And it says, Take with you some of the elders. I would imagine these would be uh, the believing elders, the ones that really had faith in the Lord. Verse 6, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So God's going to identify this certain rock. Uh, Moses is to hit it with his staff, and the problem is going to be solved. Verse 7. And he named the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? These are kind of uh, memorial names to recall the unpleasant thing that the children of Israel did here. They quarreled with the Lord. Uh, they doubted. And uh, 
but the Lord provided for them. Now, in the New Testament, in the book of John, we read about the woman at the well. I'm going to put that account at the end of this uh, lesson uh, to scroll so you can see it. But God tells the woman at the well that he can provide living water and that he who drinks of this water won't, won't get thirsty. And uh, he's talking about spiritual water, of course. But just like here, where Moses had to strike the rock, Jesus, being our rock, had to be struck, had to be smitten in order for this water to manifest itself. Uh, so as we get into the New Testament, when we see these parallels, uh, the rock, Jesus, the water, the Holy Spirit that resulted from Jesus being smitten and his death and resurrection. So another great miracle, the children of Israel see it. And we're going to go into these next verses. And apparently uh, it kind of took in that they, um, their faith in the Lord was renewed. And let's see what happens in these closing verses. Verse 8. Then, um, then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Now the Amaleks were relatives of Esau. And there was animosity between them and the, uh, their relatives the children of Israel. There's additional accounts of what we're going to read here uh, recorded in uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And in those verses, it explains that these were really bad folks. And what they did was they attacked from the rear and they, they attacked the stragglers and the uh, women and children that couldn't keep up. They were really bad. Verse 9. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So um, we get a mention of Joshua here who we're going to see repeatedly later on. Verse 10, And Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So they position themselves where they can overlook the battlefield. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed, and when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. Well, this is a symbolic issue. While Moses is the standard bearer, somebody people can see, when he is trusting the Lord, when he is putting his faith in God, just like the rest of the children of Israel, they prevail. So there's uplifted hands and the kind of symbolic, I think, of, uh, of trusting God and God's uh, miracles and his providential care for them. Verse 12, but, but Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. It's good to have uh, help, helpers. He's sitting on the stone. Again, this symbolism of the stone, relying on the stone. You know, the New Testament talks about Christ as being the, our rock, the rock of our salvation. But uh, the symbolic trusting in God and God giving them the victory uh, is an important one. Verse 13, so Joshua, Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. This is the first time we see God telling Moses to write this down. 
And as we've talked about before, Moses was fully capable of this because he was raised in the Pharaoh's household. And even though in Egypt only a very few people could write hieroglyphics, the Pharaoh and his family and the priests were the ones that could write. But Moses would have been trained in this. That's not to say he could not have written it in other language, in the Hebrew language, whatever language was prevalent at the time but he was fully capable of writing it, and the Lord says, write this down for posterity. And it uh, benefits you and I because we get to see this story and all that Moses has written in these books. The other interesting thing here, it talks about uh, blotting the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. The Bible constantly refers to remnants uh, People will be killed, tribes will be wiped out, but there'll always be a remnant. Uh, even in uh, the end times when Christ returns to the earth, there'll be remnants of some of these tribes that were really bad, but not Amalek. You won't read about them in, uh, I don't believe, in uh, Revelation or in reference to them being around the end times because God is true to his word and uh, he's gonna erase their memory and there's not gonna be a, a remnant for this tribe. It could be because they are the first ones to actually um, attack this new entity, uh, the nation of Israel. They're congealing into one people as God has wanted uh, they're starting to trust the Lord, yeah, although it's kind of a roller coaster ride. And this is the first, Amalek is the first to attack God's chosen people in that sense. And remember, God has already said, I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. And uh, he's taking that seriously in the case of Amalek. Verse 15, And Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn, The Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. So this uh, uh, instruction of the Lord, Moses follows through, and he memorializes it in writing and in this uh, physical memorial. So there's a lot here, and there's a lot more that we haven't talked about, a lot of sim symbolism, and uh, typology, but we're gonna stop there for today because we're gonna keep this basic. But this is an interesting account, how God provided uh, water, abundant water for them out of the rock, a wonderful miracle, and how he's protected them against the uh, first of their enemies since they left Egypt. I hope this has been interesting to you. I hope you'll uh, watch the next one in the meantime, God bless. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.